lopsided today. <laughs> I'll do my best to not forget you all, but I got to get my attention here. Man, you need it most over there. That happens sometimes. If you open up your uh, Bibles to Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel chapter 16. I just want to say, with, with the Sunday school, I, I enjoy those times. There's, uh, I think, uh, pastors and, and churches should probably do more of those, where there's actually a chance, not like, not like uh, drill the dummy, so to speak, but kind of drill the dummy, like ask questions to engage, to, to see, make sure you're on the same page. It's, it's, it, at, the, at its root, it's communication, right? And the more communication a uh, church does with its pastor and a pastor does with the church and the church does together, like the healthier a church will be. So I, I think those are good. And, and the beauty of the play, thing is, where else but the local church are you going to have a chance to talk about some of the most hot topics? I mean, there's a lot going on. I mean, not even to mention what happened yesterday. That, that's where the church of all places should be the place where you engage those topics, discuss them, because everything should be viewed through a biblical lens. Seeing it through a biblical lens. Because the Bible does talk, I know, I'll, I'll get to the sermon in a second, but I just want to say this, the Bible does actually talk a lot about politics. The Bible is a political document, but what does churches never want to talk about? The one thing, politics. And yet, the problem with the church not talking about that, it's leaving a bunch of people with no biblical framework to address the situation we're currently in. And if more churches would actually talk about what the Bible says, that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and all authority, all authority submits to him, that changes things. So we need to have that biblical perspective. We need to have more conversations in our churches about things that matter to our world so that we as Christians can address them to our brothers and sisters in Christ. But let's talk about Ezekiel 16 because it is most relevant. The question I want us to consider this morning is what does grace look like? Now, we talk about, that's probably one of the most, you know, we use all these words. The, the Christian language has all these words. The one that drives me crazy the most, even though it's a biblical word, is blessed. Like, what does that even mean? Most people don't even define it. They just throw it around. Grace is another one of those words. We use it all the time. And maybe some of you can define it. And that's good, right? But I don't want to talk about the definition of grace so much as I want to paint a picture this morning of what grace looks like. I want to offer a portrait of grace because, you know, we talked about what are some creative ways going up to your unbelieving friend and telling them the definition of grace. Come on now. You know better than that. But painting a portrait of grace so they see that picture and they see it displayed, that can make a difference. So what does Ezekiel do? He paints a portrait of grace this morning. A portrait of grace that impacts how we live. So we're sort of a subset question just to consider. I won't directly answer it, but how do we live grace-filled lives? How does the grace, not the definition, the definitions are important, that gives us the framework, but within that framework, once we have the framework, how do we live? How do we live? Our living is the portrait. Our lives are the picture God is painting for the world to see. Will it be a beautiful portrait of grace? If we remember from Sunday school last week, we, Jay Packer, I, I alluded to that, where he makes a distinction between knowing God and knowing about God. Many Christians know about grace. They can define it. They can talk about it. They can debate it. But they don't actually know grace. They don't actually know the depth, the wonder, the beauty, the terror even of God's grace. We need to be able to live such lives that are captivated, driven, taken hold of by God's stunning grace. And Ezekiel 16 is a picture of grace like no other. It's one of the most poignant, most powerful, most potent portraits of grace ever painted. Now, of course, the most extravagant picture of grace ever painted is the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bruised, battered, bloody naked, crucified upon a wretched Roman cross. As far as the Old Testament goes, there's Isaiah 53, which is painting the picture of Christ crucified. 
I think one that stands just a little bit below is Ezekiel 16. A picture of God's stunning grace for a wretched, wayward, rebellious people. So what's remarkable about this chapter is how blatant evil is, how deplorable, how shocking the depth of Israel's sin and rebellion is against the Lord. The reality of grace is only clearly seen amongst the backdrop of sin and the depths of sin, the brokenness of sin, the evilness of sin. It's within the context of that sin where Ezekiel paints a picture of grace. See, Ezekiel 16 is really a picture about God's grace to sinners. It's about God's grace. And through the story of Israel, all who believe and trust in Jesus Christ are engrafted into Israel. And we now, this story of Ezekiel 16 is our story. It's our shared history. It's our shared story. And it remains for God, his word, to come to us and remind us of his stunning grace. Now, this is a long chapter. I I went ahead and read it and timed it. It takes about nine minutes for me to read it relatively fast. I'm not going to read the chapter. I'm going to encourage you, though, to go home and read the chapter. It's like 63. It's a long one. Go home and read it if you haven't read it recently. But what I am going to do is take phrases, take sections, and highlight them. And I'll read those passages to help carry the flow of the passage. So you'll still get the idea of what's unfolding in the chapter, even if I don't spend the 10 minutes reading it. Okay, I want to wrap around four things. The first one is this. In verses 1 through 14, the Lord gives life. Verses 1 to 14, the Lord gives life. The second is that Israel plays the whore. Verses 15 to 34, Israel plays the whore. Third, back to the Lord, he executes judgment. See this in verses 35 to 58. The Lord executing his judgment, 35 to 58. And last, the Lord remembers his covenant mercy, verses 59 to 63. So, first, the Lord gives life, verses 1 to 14. Second, Israel plays the whore, 15 to 34. Third, the Lord executes judgment, 35 to 58. And last, the Lord remembers his covenant mercy, 59 to 63. Let's begin with the Lord giving life. Verses 1 to 14, but before Ezekiel begins the story that he unfolds, he's actually commissioned with a task. As a prophet, his primary role is to confront people with their sin and to call them back to repentance. Now, we often have this idea when we think of prophets as those who predict the future, and they do predict the future, but what do they actually do? The role of the prophets is proclamation with the call to repentance. The prophet's role is to call a wayward people back to their God. Now, sometimes and often that involves telling the future, but often it also involves telling the past. Telling the past, telling the future, telling the history of Israel, telling the potential future of Israel if they repent. All of this is wrapped up in the job of a prophet. And here in verses 1 to 2, Ezekiel is commissioned by God. And look at verses 1 to 2, what what he's told. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel says, Son of man, Make known to Jerusalem her abominations. Now that's not an enviable task. Here is Ezekiel with the exiles, five years living in a foreign land, five years ripped away from their home, five years ripped away from everything they've known. And God says, there's a reason why you're in exile. Ezekiel, your job is to tell those people why they're in exile. Remind them of their sin. And, you know, it's, it's, always a fascinating, it's always a fascinating thing with humanity, right? This. We so quickly, so easily, so wonderfully, and often with delight, point out the sin in others. And what do we rarely see in our own hearts? Our own sin. We rarely see that. We need help. We need others' help. This is just a side note, but we need other help. It's the duty of every Christian to lovingly and compassionately speak the word of God into the life of others. And to notice there, I emphasize lovingly and compassionately speaking the word of life to others. I love, uh, if you've, for those of you who have read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together, just uh, two quotes from it. He says, speaking of how we all followers of Christ exist and have the same troubles, the same sin, the same problems, 
he says this, the basis on which Christians can speak to one another is that each knows the other as a sinner. What do we often do, though? We often say, well, um, yeah, they're, they're a sinner. Well, I, I got that part together. That's not my problem. I don't do that sin. Then we point out someone else's sin. We always do that, right? What Bonhoeffer is saying, no, we're all equal. We're all sinners. And he says, who even given all one's human renown is forlorn and lost if not given help. We are lost if not given help. So what does that help look like? Bonhoeffer continues. He says, we talk to one another about the help we both need. We admonish one another to go the way Christ bids us to go. We warn one another against the disobedience that is our undoing. We are gentle and we are firm with one another. For we know both God's kindness and God's firmness. Because God is kind and he is firm, we must also be kind and firm. Throughout the book of Ezekiel, the prophet does not shy away from proclaiming God's firmness, his judgment, but he also, especially towards the end, proclaims God's kindness, his grace, and mercy. Ezekiel begins the story painting a picture of this remarkable picture of grace. At the very beginning, Israel is described as born. She is birthed by pagan Canaanite parents, and then she is brutally discarded. Her cord is not cut. She was not washed nor cleansed, and she wasn't wrapped in cloths. All this happens. All this is painting the picture to show a complete betrayal of parents throwing their child away, a lack of love, a lack of care. Instead of being cared for and loved, she's cast out in the wilderness as an infant to be devoured and destroyed. Now, sadly, this was a common practice back then and remained a common practice even in, well into beyond New Testament times where children that were not wanted were just thrown away, left. The moment they were born, it was an abortive measure. Basically, the moment they were born, they were discarded, left for the elements and the wild animals to destroy them. It was horrendous practice, common then. And Ezekiel, the Lord is giving Ezekiel this picture and saying, that is what you used to be, Israel. You were discarded, thrown away, helpless, hopeless, exposed, naked, and bare. And then the Lord walks by. In verses 6 to 7, we read, And when I passed, the Lord says, And when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, Live! I said to you in your blood, Live! And then the Lord says, I made you flourish. The Lord rescued a broken, abandoned, hopeless, helpless child, Israel, and he made her flourish. And then, verse 8, the Lord enters into a covenant. And it's a picture of a marriage covenant. Look at verse 8. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God. And I love this phrase, and you became mine. The Lord set his love and affection upon this child exposed, thrown away, discarded. And he bathed her, cleansed her, anointed her with oil, and he poured his love and affection upon her. And verses 8 to 15 continue to show him pouring his love and affection. It's not just that the Lord gave her life. The Lord made her flourish. He poured out gifts upon her. He bathed her. He washed her. He anointed her with oil. He clothed her. He wrapped her in fine linen, covered her with silk, adorned her, put on fine jewelry. She's adorned with gold and silver. And then we read verses 13 to 14. Look at that. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. All that Israel had was from God. All of it. She was discarded thrown away. And the Lord set his covenant love upon her, his affection, his care, his love. He brought life to her, and he brought flourishing to her. 
He gave her so many good gifts, the source of life, the source of her power, the source of her wisdom, the source of her strength. All of this is a gift of God. In Israel, the Lord's beautiful bride is loved and cherished and honored. And she grew exceedingly beautiful, so beautiful that all the nations saw her beauty. She became a stunning queen to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It says she was perfect to the splendor that the Lord put upon her. The Lord regaled her in the splendor and majesty and beauty. And note, the Lord did this. The Lord did all of this. His outpoured love, His kindness, His grace, His mercy. And now verses 15 to 34 turn to show how the stunning, radiant bride treats her lover. How does Israel respond to the Lord's lavish love? Before we answer that, as you probably already see a comment, I, I just want to notice how the subject shifts. Throughout this chapter, it's fascinating, the, the primary subject is the Lord. And then Israel is the object. She is the one acted upon. And here, in this section, there's a shift. It goes from what the Lord is doing to what Israel does. And it's just in this one section. The rest of the chapter is all about God doing, the Lord doing. But here, this one sh section, 15 to 34, is about what Israel is doing. And what does she do? Look at verse 15. But you trusted in your beauty and played the whore. Because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby, Israel turned from God and played the whore. Now the language used throughout verses 15 to 34 paints Israel as a prostitute. And it gets even worse, as we'll see. And that's exactly what happened. Instead of loving the giver of her gifts, Israel turns away from the Lord, her lover, and she turns to everyone else. And Ezekiel has to use this strong language, you played the whore. Seven times there's that phrase, you played the whore. And there's other phrases that emphasize her prostitution, her giving away all that God has given. She's taken all of his good gifts and used them to love others. Spit in the face of her God. Now this is language that may make us feel uncomfortable, but it, it well describes our own hearts, does it not? Sinful, wayward, rebellious human hearts. Hearts that turn away from God. Because that is what wickedness, that is what it is. Since the moment Adam and Eve first questioned and then rebelled against God's very word, we have been exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And that unfolds in numerous ways. But it all comes down to this one thing. To turning away from God, turning to something else. And that turning away to something else here for Israel is to turn to other lovers. This is exactly how it unfolds in the history of Israel. And it has, it has unfolded in our own lives when we think about it. And thankfully, to God's grace and mercy by the Spirit, we turn back to God. And only by His grace and mercy. We turn back to God. So how exactly does Israel play the whore? Now the particular concern of this chapter is Israel's relationship with other nations. When Israel was coming to the promised land, they had one job to do. What was that? And not wipe them out. It was punishment. It was a judgment for their sin. She failed to do that. And the moment... She failed to do that. She became, she really succumbed to their pressure and she began the relationship. A relationship that never should have existed. She began to prostitute herself. And sadly, this picture, you can read it when you get home, is painted that she actually became so bad that she was worse than all the pagan nations. Worse. The very nation that God set His covenant love and affection upon becomes worse. They were supposed to be a shining light. They were supposed to be a draw that all the other nations would come and see the light that they gave forth. Why is there Leviticus? Because it's meant to show the holiness of God and to be outwardly reflected as a holy people to show forth the beauty and wonder and glory of God. It's supposed to be attractive. And instead of attracting others by her beautiful glory and holiness, she repels others 
because she becomes worse than them. Look at verse 30. How sick is your heart, declares the Lord. How sick is your heart? Because you did all these things, the deeds of a brazen prostitute. And then it gets worse. Though depicted as a prostitute, Ezekiel shifts the imagery then to an adulterous wife. Now there's a difference, right, between a prostitute and a wife. A prostitute is there to be used. You use a prostitute. A wife is meant to be loved, cherished cared for and here ezekiel is saying you're no longer a prostitute you're a wife who instead of loving in response to all the love i've poured upon you you've spit in my face you've rejected my love you've went against me now this passage bears mark similarity to another story we have in the new testament we call it the story of the prodigal son here it's a story of a prodigal wife but the same idea. Here, there's a loving, caring husband who pours his love affection, gives so many gifts, she flourishes. And what does she do in response? Takes those gifts and gives them to her lovers. Throws away the love, the only love that will ever satisfy her, and chases after other lovers that will not satisfy. And we'll see that at the end, just like that prodigal son who comes home, she is loved. That prodigal wife is loved once more. But we're not there yet. Verses 35 to 38, the Lord executes judgment. The third section here. The narrative shifts back away again from what Israel is doing. The Lord becomes the subject again. He becomes the one who now responds to his wayward wife. She played the whore. He is the broken, jilted husband. And the Lord is a jealous God. His beautiful bride, the very one whom he brought to life, the one he poured out lavish gifts upon, rejects his covenant love and chases after other lovers. And he is not a passive husband. He is not a passive husband. He is a jealous lover. And he is jealous for his wife. Jealous for his affection. And he's also a holy God. So the jealous, holy God must pour out his wrath and judgment. Look at verses 35 to 37. In this ironic twist, Israel, the Lord uses Israel's own lovers to bring about her judgment. Look at verses 35 to 37. Therefore, a prostitute, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because your lust was poured out, and your nakedness uncovered in your whorings with your lovers and with all your abominable idols, and because of the blood of your children that you gave to them, therefore, behold, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved and all those you hated. I will gather them against you from every side and will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all your nakedness. Where was Israel when the Lord met her? naked, wallowing in blood, hopeless and helpless. And now, because of her waywardness, her sinful rebellion against God, God is putting her back to the point where he started. And it's remarkable, the Lord uses Israel's very lovers against her. All those she loved, all those she stood with, all those she poured out her affection towards are those who now turn and send judgment upon her. All the nations that Israel brought alliances with, all the nations that Israel sought to cuddle and strengthen their political power with, all of them come to destroy Israel. Yet even here, no, notice this. What, what is the, for those of you familiar with the Old Testament, those know that what is... For those who commit adultery, there's only one punishment. It is death. So here, in remarkable act of judgment, God also still shows mercy. Israel is left naked and bare, stoned and then cut to pieces by her lover's swords. And while this imagery highlights complete destruction, the Lord leaves a remnant. The Lord leaves a people. He pours out his wrath on his wayward lover, 
but he does not completely wipe her out. What is that called? Mercy. Grace. The Lord proclaims in verses 42 to 43. So will I satisfy my wrath on you, and my jealousy shall depart from you. I will be calm and will be no more, no more be angry. Because you have not remembered the days of your youth, but have enraged me with all these things, therefore, behold, I have returned your deeds upon your head, declares the Lord God. The Lord, Israel's lover, executes judgment. His wrath is poured out. Israel's evil and wicked and rebellious sin finds punishment as they're in exile. But God doesn't give her all that she deserves. He keeps her. He leaves grace and mercy. And it's here in verses 59 to 63, we see the Lord return to mercy. This full, unfettered, undeserved grace, the Lord remembers his covenant. He remembers mercy. Look at verses 59 to 63. For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, you who have despised the oath and breaking the covenant, yet I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish for you an everlasting covenant. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you take your sisters, both your elder and your younger, and I give them to you as daughters, but not on account of the covenant with you. I will establish my covenant with you and you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth again because of your shame. When I atone for you for all that you have done, declares the Lord God. Again, who is the one who is acting throughout this entire passage of Scripture? The Lord God. This is kind of the climax of the passage. I just want to slow down for a moment and look at three aspects of what the Lord does here. The first thing is that the, it all begins with the Lord remembering, remembering his covenant with Israel. Now, as we know, it's not that the Lord forgot. The idea of remembering in Scripture is full of action. When the Lord remembers something, it's not saying, oh, the light bulb popped on his head. It says that the Lord is going to do something about it. The Lord never forgot his covenant. It's just now the Lord is going to act upon his covenant. He remembers it and he acts and he establishes with Israel an everlasting covenant, a forever covenant, a covenant without end. And what does that covenant do? It leads to Israel remembering. This everlasting covenant is transformative. It leads to Israel to remember the Lord, to remember his covenant promise, and it leads them to repentance and restoration. Look at verse 62. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And this isn't knowing about the Lord. This is knowing the Lord. This is covenant language. This is returning the relationship back to husband and wife. It rarely happens in our day and age, but you do hear the stories of either a husband or a wife who one or the other commits adultery. And what usually happens, it ends in divorce. But occasionally and remarkably and profoundly, there are the few stories where there's forgiveness and restoration. And that is what's unfolding here. It's a picture of unmerited, undeserved, unfathomable grace to take back because it's not just that Israel left God. Israel stole from him all the gifts the Lord poured out. That's what adultery happens. It's stealing from someone else. All that you've given of yourself to that person. And when you go and commit adultery with someone else, you're giving it away. What's not yours to give. And here, the Lord says, I know what you've done. I've seen it. And I forgive you. And how does he do that? How does he do that? The Lord atones for all that they have done. Right there in Ezekiel. The Lord atones. Here is where this whole chapter matters. We cannot take the last few verses in isolation. To understand the depths of God's grace, we must truly grasp the depth of our sin. And once we grasp the depth of our sin, which I'll, I'll probably go on to say, fair to say, we'll never truly grasp how deeply sinful we are. We never will. 
But here, we strive to grasp the depth of our sin, so then we see the grace of God. And when God atones for sin, He covers it over the sin, the shame, the evil, the waywardness, all gone. The one sin that you hate to even bring to mind because it brings so much shame in your heart. And maybe even the closest around you don't even know it. Gone. Covered. Atoned. Removed. He does not deal with us according to our sins, the psalmist says. Nor does He repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, So far does He remove our transgressions from us. Inseparable, unfathomable, undeserved, unmerited grace. Our sins covered. Throughout this passage, all the good in the passage comes from God. What does Israel bring to the table? Sin, rebellion, wickedness. But even in spite of her abject sinfulness, God still remembers his covenant and pours out love upon her. The ultimate picture of God's covenant remembrance will come hundreds of years later as the Jewish prophet hangs naked, bruised, battered, and bloodied upon a wretched Roman cross. For humanity to be reconciled to God, God himself will become human. Become man to live a perfect life, a life that none of us could live. To die a sacrificial death, yet to rise again in power and might, defeating once and forever death. Yes, the Lord brings judgment. He poured out his ultimate wrath upon his son, the very one who did not deserve that judgment, the one who stood in our place. It's not that God just stops judging. No, he did judge. He poured out his wrath upon his beloved son. Wrath that you and I deserved. Poured upon the innocent one. And his people engrafted into the people of God. The story of Israel in Ezekiel 16 becomes our story. It's a picture of our own wayward hearts, but God's loving compassion. It's a portrait of our sinful rebellion, but Christ's reconciling work. It's a picture of our covenant breaking, but God's ever faithful covenant keeping. It's a picture of us dead in our trespasses and sins, but it's a picture of God making us alive together with Christ. Ezekiel 16 is a beautiful picture of the unfathomable grace of God, ultimately demonstrated and put on display by Christ crucified and risen again. Brothers and sisters, this is God's loving grace for you and I, a people who very much does not deserve. Let's pray. Our Father, strengthen us with power through your Spirit in our inner being. Christ, we ask you to dwell in our hearts through faith so that we may be rooted and grounded in love. And Spirit of God, strengthen us to comprehend what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Fill us with all your fullness, O God. For you are able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think, according to your great power that is in work in us. May you be glorified in your church, and may Jesus Christ be lifted up forever and ever. Amen.